How do we get from where we are to where we want to be? All of you watching this video are to some degree futurists. You see the possibility of humanity spreading out into the ocean of night that we call space. You all come from different cultures, different continents. We do not all agree on everything, but we all know that without access to a frontier, without the ability to spread out into the solar system, without the opportunity to develop disparate new cultures and technologies, humanity is doomed. There was never a guarantee that we would succeed. Let's look at some of the factors that must be considered to give us our best chance. How do we navigate through space? Historically, finding your way was vital to survival. If our ancestors became lost while hunting or foraging, it was almost certain doom. Humans are one of the physically weakest of all animals. A pygmy chimp half our size can tear us apart. We are only strong in groups when we plan, develop technology, and work together. Most animals, including humans, have a set of semicircular canals that are oriented in the three primary planes. These canals are filled with a fluid and, when we move our heads, this fluid moves also, moving hair cells in the canals, like wheat in a breeze. These movements are detected and signals are sent to our brain to report the movement. We have another organ here. This one actually has small stones in it called otoliths. There are hair cells around the inside of the chamber and this tells us which way is down. It is a gravity detector and it will work underwater if you close your eyes and give it a chance. Even jellyfish have these. In the past if this detector quit working it usually meant that we had eaten a toxin and we developed a vomiting reflex to get rid of poison. This is why astronauts almost always get sick on exposure to freefall and need up to three days to adapt. Some never do. These systems make up a human's natural inertial guidance system. Movement is detected and mapped into the brain. This tells us the body's location and orientation relative to itself, but not our physical location geographically. Geese and some other animals have tiny magnetic stones in their brains that give them a natural compass to navigate during their migrations. It is unclear if humans have a remnant of this, but there is some evidence that we might. Before GPS, we found our way by natural cues. We knew that the sun rose in the east and set in the west. Then at night we used constellations to find our way. The stars were important to all navigators in the ancient world. The ancient Mayans were able to calculate the movement of the stars with extreme precision tens of thousands of years into the future. And before even these, we find the world's first mechanical computer, or at least the first we know of. The Antikythera's mechanism. This ancient device had wheels with cogs that could be set to the stars and sun location visible to you. It would then calculate your location. Imagine if this technology had not been destroyed by war and ignorance. If the Library of Alexandria had not been burned. Or Archimedes had not been murdered. Archimedes had developed calculus in 212 BC. But he was speared by a soldier, impatiently searching for the treasured genius that their raid was meant to acquire, the great scientist Archimedes. The soldier was looking for a member of nobility and wealth, not an old man in a plain robe drawing in the sand. Throughout history, those with knowledge have suffered at the hands of those with power. Just as Hypatia was murdered in Alexandria, as the library was put to the torch. The Chinese first used a lodestone or natural magnet as early as 20 BC to find a magnetic north and navigate. This technology was used extensively as documented by Xin Guo in the 7th century. These ancient mariners were brilliant at using these natural instruments and indicators to find their way. Hundreds of years later the Vikings spoke in their writings of a magical sunstone 
that could help them know where the sun was located, even when it was obscured. This was believed to be a myth until one was found. The sunstone seems to have been a crystal of Icelandic calcite. This mineral is birefringent and able to separate polarized light. By looking through it, you can indeed locate the sun, even in heavy fog or cloud cover, even if it is below the horizon. Imagine where we would be now if knowledge were valued more than gold and so much had not been lost. The night sky is its own tapestry of navigation points. In the northern hemisphere, the North Star seems to be near the pivot point of the universe due to the Earth's location in the galaxy. Ancient Arabic navigators used a kamal, which was a board with a string. You held the string in your teeth and put the top of the board level with the North Star and arranged the bottom in line with the horizon of the sea. This could give you your latitude. If you knew your direction of travel and latitude, you could reverse your course to get back home. In the Southern Hemisphere, familiar constellations like the Southern Cross can help lead you back home on a dark night. Not long ago, to navigate on Earth, you needed a compass, a good map, and a lot of knowledge. Now you just need a good smartphone or GPS, like a Garmin. These devices help you find where you are by listening to the signals from multiple satellites in orbit. But they didn't exist until 1995, and accurate signals only became available publicly in 2000. These satellites send out a timestamp that is accurate to nanoseconds. When your receiver gets these signals, it compares the time to its internal clock set by a ground station and can tell how long it took every satellite signal to reach it. If you can get a lock on four or more satellites, and GPS has 32 satellites in orbit for the U.S. system, you can calculate your location down to less than a meter. This is great on Earth, but these satellites are in a medium Earth orbit at about 22,200 kilometers. You could use this in low Earth orbit, but these satellites have their transmitters pointing toward the Earth. Go too far out, and you won't usually be able to receive these signals. Though a NASA satellite called the Magnetosphere Multiscale Spacecraft was able to get a lock at 70,000 kilometers. This won't help you on your way to the moon, which is an average of about 384,400 kilometers away. Speaking of the moon, we will get an understanding of the Apollo mission's navigation devices to get an understanding of space navigation. We keep coming back to Apollo in our studies because no one else has ventured further than low Earth orbit. Only 12 human beings have ever accomplished this feat. I look forward to the day when we can compare the navigation instruments of multiple nations as they find their way to the moon and beyond. Until then, we would do well to listen to those who have accomplished that which we still dream of today. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology was given the task of solving the problem of space navigation. Some instrument manufacturers complained, but MIT had Professor Charles Draper an engineer who believed in building for the real world. Bob Siemens was one of the students who worked with Professor Draper. They developed an accurate inertial guidance system, tested on aircraft, that would help guide the American astronauts to the moon. Most inertial guidance systems of that time, and even some now, use spinning gyroscopes to detect changes in motion. These gyroscopes are put in different orientations to track movement along the three major axes. These gyroscopes resist movement, and their resistance is used to help alert the pilot of changes in the orientation of the device. It reports changes to what is called inertial space. It is the computer equivalent to the vestibular system developed by evolution millions of years ago. Now the Earth is not flat, despite what someone might say on Facebook. This means that as you travel over the Earth with an inertial guidance system, it retains a base orientation relative to where you set it. You must account for this as you travel around the Earth. These gyroscopes were precision instruments made to a standard that would make the most exacting Swiss watch company proud. To keep the IGS calibrated, the MIT engineers decided to use a sextant to take a reading from the stars and verify orientation. To track all the minute changes in orientation reported by the inertial guidance system, a new device was needed. A computer. Computers in the early 1960s were massive. 
The thought of getting one into a spacecraft was almost unimaginable. But an engineer named Dick Batten was assigned the task and believed it could be done. He set a goal of one cubic foot. He used silicone chips, which were brand new, instead of vacuum tubes to reduce size. He set up a protocol of weighing the chips, immersing them in Freon, and weighing them again. Any retained weight would mean a defect in the chip, and the entire batch would be discarded. At one time, 60% of all silicone chips manufactured in the United States were going to NASA. How Lanning was the software genius that thought of using priority time sharing to make sure critical functions were handled first. Astronauts worked directly with the engineers to make sure the end product would be usable to those whose lives would depend on it. At this time, software did not exist. Computers at that time were hardwired to do one task and had to be rewired to do another. True programming was developed during this time. Programs were written and punched paper cards were made to load the program into the computer. The result was printed on a line printer. The main limitation was memory. The Apollo guidance system had 12,300 transistors with only 2K of RAM, or random access memory, and 36K of ROM, or read-only memory. RAM changes, ROM does not. Tape drives were considered too fragile for the read-only memory. So the engineers invented rope memory. Dedicated workers would weave ring magnets into a string of woven fibers. As a magnet passed through a reader, it would trip the indicator and give a 1. A non-magnetic ring gave a 0. These ropes took months to weave, and error correction was very difficult. Refining the software and maximizing available memory became a priority. By 1966, it was clear that the new systems and inertial guidance system backed up by radio beacons from the ground, would be enough to get the astronauts to the moon, with the astronauts depending on the IGS only as they traveled across the far side, more alone than any human beings had ever been before. The finished Apollo computer was a thing of beauty. Even today it looks advanced. The Apollo guidance computer verified by Sextant was then tested in orbit and worked perfectly. Apollo 8 was the first human excursion around the moon and a real test of this system. Jim Lovell was able to show that the stars and a sextant alone could be used in an emergency on this flight. This knowledge would come in handy when Apollo 13 suffered an in-flight explosion that knocked out their power systems. For Apollo 8, the AGC again worked perfectly, even around the far side of the moon, and was used in every flight thereafter. Four of these Apollo computers were used in every Apollo launch, as one controlled the rocket itself, one controlled the command module, one controlled the lunar lander during its descent, and one was on the lander for abort if necessary. It was never necessary. An inertial guidance system is only as good as its installation, however. A Russian technician was able, on a Soyuz rocket, with a large hammer I have been told, to install one upside down. The device worked perfectly. The rocket, however, did not. Today, some inertial guidance systems often use long spools of fiber optic threads. These are put in the correct orientation and a laser is fired down the fiber. If the device is rotated along an axis perpendicular to the fiber wrap, the laser light will be red shifted or blue shifted by a tiny fraction. These shifts are detected and the movement responsible for the change is calculated and used to update the orientation of the spacecraft. Most satellites use the equivalent of a computerized sextant called star trackers. These are simply photo cells or cameras that detect the pattern of stars visible to it and from there know where that side of the craft is pointing. There are 57 bright stars used for most navigation, but modern systems can track thousands of stars disregarding sun flares, comets, and other sources of error, and report their location with extreme accuracy. If you have inputs from all sides of your craft, and it's in orbit, you always know the side with the giant no-star location is pointed at Earth, and the sides with stars are not. Identifying the star patterns on the non-occluded sides will tell you the rest. But what about deep space navigation? Most deep space probes like Voyager and New Horizons are tracked by radio signals. The deep space network of receivers can help detect with extreme accuracy the location and distance to the probe, but not its orientation. 
the orientation must be detected by these star finders or star trackers on the probe itself. All of this data can then be used to calculate course corrections, which are always necessary. When the engine is fired, the probe must be in the exact correct orientation to have the desired effect on its path. The solar system has been defined by scientists to have a north and a south. This is based on the standard model of the Earth's rotation and accepted orientation. Sorry, Australia. The planets of our solar system lie roughly in a plane in their orbit of the Sun. This plane is called the ecliptic. The fact that Pluto is at a greater angle to the ecliptic than all the other planets implies that it was either disturbed from its original orbit or had a different developmental history. We can navigate through our solar system effectively by knowing where the Sun is and our orientation in space. Now maybe our children will develop new directions, perhaps sunward and darkward. But how could our descendants navigate between the stars? What if we do develop warp drive and solve all the associated problems with using it? Would there be a way to know where we were in the galaxy? There is indeed. It turns out that pulsars are the remnants of collapsed stars rotating at unimaginably fast speeds, producing jets of energy and matter that pulse with a regular rhythm. Some of this energy is in the frequency of radio waves and were detected on Earth long ago and thought to possibly be alien beacons. These pulsars also put out X-rays, which have higher energy than radio waves and can be detected inside a ship. A washing machine sized instrument has been developed that is basically a pulsar finder. Like the star trackers, it scans the X-ray spectrum, tracking and cataloging the different pulsars it sees and the frequency of their signals. By locating these, it can know exactly where it is in relation to these stars. Now the galaxy is rotating, but it does not rotate like a whirlpool, as you might think. It rotates like an old record on a record player. The star is being held in place by the incredible gravitational power of dark matter. These systems will help us navigate today and in the future so that we can find our way to our destiny. Thanks for listening. Stay safe. And may you always find your way home.